Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. My name is Will Schick. I'm Director of Product Development for Atomic Mass Games. And today we are going to be painting the Shocker, or just Shocker. I don't think the is actually part of his name, but you know, it sounds better when you say it that way. Important to note for all of you who might be confused and who wouldn't be with a name like the Shocker, this guy doesn't use electricity. He actually just uses shock waves, vibrational energy. So one of our challenges today is going to be figuring out how to paint the vibrational energy. It's done a couple of different ways in the comics. Sometimes it's painted blue, sometimes it's painted yellow. Just like Electro last week, we've got some options. Um, so we're going to see if we get to that later today as well. But otherwise, let's just dive right in and start painting Mr. Herman here. One thing I realized that I didn't grab was water. That's fine. We have some dirty water left over from Dallas last week. It'll be great. I can't see the screen in case you're wondering. It doesn't matter to me, but if somebody has a question, I can't answer it. Because I can't see it. I got nothing to see. Let's put out a couple little drops of medium here. I like to put some on the palette just so I have it to mix in. So first things first, we're just going to make kind of like a bit of a brown wash. And we're going to run this into his padded suit. One of my favorite things about all these Sinister Six characters is they're really not that fancy in terms of colors. So with Shocker, you have kind of the ochre color of his padded suit, and then you have the kind of burnt red of the like leather part of it, I guess. Um, and that's it. And that's basically all of Shocker. So um, whoop, let's get rid of that. So this boy should go fairly easily and quickly. I'll darken that up just a little bit. Let's go a little bit darker here. So for the most part, we're just gonna do washes. We're gonna let the detail of the sculpt itself do as much of the hard work as we can. Now we could start with our brighter color and just let it kind of pool into the crevices, but um, because I want, because I really want that deep definition in the suit lining and I don't want to spend a lot of time because we only get an hour going through and picking it all out with the brush or having to mess with slower techniques. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in, I'm going to let it pool in there and then I'm just going to quickly like wipe using my fingertip because that's what I've got easy access to right now. I'm just going to wipe a lot of that color off. And then what that will do is it'll leave only the paint in the deepest crevices. So a little bit of like an antiquing approach. If you've ever done antiquing and crafts or stuff like that. So a lot of time we spend all of our effort trying not to touch the miniature as we're painting it, but in this case, the rules don't apply. We're gonna touch the miniature and get rid of all that paint we don't want wherever we don't want it. Um, now it's important for this to work. You obviously, I think I had, oh yeah, I do. Still got some Q-tips over here, so we can just use the Q-tips instead of my finger. Um, you just want to make sure that the paint is nice and flowing like a wash so that it does get in all those cracks and crevices. And you just kind of quickly and gently scrape it off the top and that'll just leave it nice, nice and neat where you want it. And then when we get to the kind of the undersides of the suit or places where it's going to be darker, I'll necessarily have to wipe the paint off if I don't want to, or I can be a little less extreme with it because those areas will want to be um, more shaded anyway. So when we put our ochre paint over the top, having it mix a bit more with the darker brown will work in the way that we want it to. So you can always play with these different kinds of techniques and options to build your layers. Obviously, this is kind of a down and dirty method to do it. Allows you to get quick results. 
but you 100% could just do this wash, go back through, highlight up some of the parts, go again, um, and get a similar effect without quite as much of the work. We're looking to get these cool characters on the table, get them painted to tabletop quality standard. And I'm not, I'm not thinking about worthy kind of level of details or anything like that. I just want to get nice, solid, strong results quickly. Now, one of the other options that I could do is instead of using the acrylic paints for this part, I could use my oil paints for it in which case I would just paint all the colors down first and then use my oil washes. Kind of a similar approach where you would just paint the oil wash over everything you wanted to be colored and then you would wipe it cleanly off um, everything but the deepest crevices that you wanted to be in that color. So there's no end of technique options available to you to do all these different kinds of things. Uh, is the bottom part glued to the base. So yeah, this is this little shockwave bit is just loose So you just glue it to the base wherever you want So it lines up and then he's got these little feet pads here of you know shockwave energy of him breaking the ground as he digs in But this part just goes wherever it wants so it doesn't have to go over the lip uh, Okay, so we have that done now we go into our Little bit of yellow ochre here This will be the primary color for the whole shebang. And Let's see, it's a little darker than we want it to be here. All right, so this ochre has really good coverage, which is good to know. So we're just going to kind of like build up our colors here. And then once we finish this part, we'll move on to the red part of the suit, or the burnt red part of the suit. What was the plan when designing Chalker? Uh... I mean, when it came to the sculpts or the rules, I mean, the plan was, as it is with every character, is just to make the coolest version of the character that we identified as. And, you know, with Shocker, the couple different steps to that one was to, you know, look at building out that classic, the classic options for Sinister Six against Spider-Man. I'm going to make sure that Shocker was... Um, dangerous, but not obviously over overly powerful. We talked a little bit last week when we were painting Electro about how the only character in that pack that really started at a higher threat level was uh, Sandman. We originally thought Sandman might be a five a five threat character with what we wanted to do with his sand constructs and everything. So he started at a five. Shocker was kind of always envisioned to be a three threat. Um, we just felt like that give, gave him the appropriate power level and the ability to do the things we wanted to do with his kit to make him interesting and fun um, and to provide a bit more variety and flexibility and options for spider foes players and criminal syndicate players and whoever else wanted a, another three that focused a little bit on displacement and stuff. So. He was definitely one of those characters that was unique to balance through testing, just given the fact that a lot of his shtick is, you know, pushing people around, stunning them, doing a bit more control, um, and control characters can often be a little dangerous to work on because they can spiral a bit on you if you're not careful. Um, so he had a couple different iterations and balance passes as we went through testing. 
just to make sure that he would kind of live up to what we want him to be and not be too punitive or overpowered for his threat cost. Offer some interesting tricks. A lot of the spider foe stuff really focuses on you know, teamwork and, and group debuffing, so Shocker has this role to fill within the spider foes itself in terms of you know, providing stuns and knocking people off of points and doing all that kind of cool stuff, shocking them as it were. But he kind of sets up, disorients and sets up the characters for the big blow to happen from one of his other spider foe compadres, whether that's, you know, Green Goblin or a Carnage or an Electro or a Sandman. Um, well, the Sandman does play a similar role in game as people have seen from his card as Shocker a bit in terms of the displacement and the, you know, setting folks up for the follow-up strike. And then from the miniatures perspective, you know, our goal of Shocker was really to just kind of like figure out how in the world to do a cool display of his powers. And one of the things we really like to do and, um, You know, we've kind of carved out in the studio as one of our big marks of like Tom Mass Games style of sculpting. When and where it makes sense is to do all these cool effects, right? So we had a lot of discussion about the shock wave. Tactical shocks, I love it. Tactical shocks, indeed. Um, but yeah, so uh, one of the big things that we discussed was just how do you get that sense of energy and, you know, those iconic comic moments when you think about Shocker fighting Spider-Man and what you kind of see him doing, he's always, he's always lining up to do some kind of big, some kind of big shockwave explosion thing with his gauntlets. And um, we had a lot of conversations about how we could capture that in the miniature and what that would take. To pull off. So when painting yellow, the best trick is, it's similar to painting white, is to just not paint yellow. Um, so you'll see right now that on my palette, I have a brown, I have an ochre, and then I have my actual yellow. So my actual yellow, I'm not really going to use that much. Um, I'm actually just going to use the yellow to mix into the ochre. And the reason that I do that is because the yellow ochre is a brown, um, not a true yellow. So it has uh, it has much better coverage and opacity than a yellow, than a normal yellow paint does. So what you want to do is use, use gradients of color and then only use your pure yellow as your kind of brightest highlight or on your, like sparingly on your points. Otherwise you just mix in the pure yellow with the ochre and what that'll do is it'll create, it'll create a color that your eye will read primarily as yellow. Um, and so this is a similar trick to white, right? Uh, white is defined by its shadows. So what you do is you don't paint, you don't actually paint white, you paint, um, you paint in white chromatics, like this blue right here, which will read as white to the eye as you build it up. Uh, and it allows you to avoid all of those like not great tendencies of like white paint or yellow paint. This is true for orange too. If you really want to get away with it, you don't paint orange. Um, so you want to build up your color from something else. Now you can do that in a couple different ways. You can use an ochre like I've done here. You can use pink. Uh, there's a lot of really great videos and tips and tricks on utilizing a pink undertone or an undercoat to pick up your yellow. You can um, utilize purple as well because purple and yellow are um, good complementary colors. So they will function really well together. Um, and you can use that to do shading or to, you know, create nice little color transitions and highlights and everything else. But the primary trick to painting yellow is just don't paint actual yellow. 
um, find a good ochre, and in this case, yellow ochre is the hobby, uh, monument paint that I'm using right now. Um, so yellow ochre does, does the trick perfectly well. And you can um, fairly easily build up your base. Tones with fewer layers, you know, your paints will come out largely smoother, your colors will look better because you'll be layering on less, less amounts of paint, right? You want to keep to those thin coats, those thin, even layers if you possibly can. Uh, let's see, we're getting a little too yellow here, so I need to add back in a bit more of my ochre. Um, but that's it. So, again, the goal is, you know, we think of yellows and, and everything as this solid color, but what we're actually seeing for the most part is the shadows and the shades and then just enough yellow that we can read that our brain picks up, oh, this is a yellow, a yellow thing, similar to how whites work. Um, but those pigments, like yellow pigments, red pigments, orange pigments, they're usually very weak. So the color, the foundational pigments that make them up, they're not very strong. They don't have a strong opacity. They struggle to do good coverage. And the way to fix that or to combat that is to just mix them and build gradients with colors that have yellows in them or have similar tones. Um, that help their opacity, crank up their opacity, and then trick the eye a little bit into reading the color as something that it's not. Uh, you can start with brown for orange as well. You can do a red. Um, you can do, you know, if you want to get really tricksy, you can do a yellow, and then you can use a red glaze, and that will create a really vibrant orange um, that you control really well. So orange, I believe you can also use pink for orange, or you can use various shades of magenta and stuff for orange as well. Um, it all kind of comes down to finding, finding the paints that you like to work with and the ones that give you the overall effects that you like the best. So I know that Dallas has done, he did a, a yellow paint job using pink as the foundational color. I've tried that once or twice, and for me, I just didn't love. I didn't love working over the pink. It just didn't. It didn't click for me. It didn't work as well. So I typically I will use yellow ochre, or an ochre, a brown ochre, to build up my yellows, and then I'll just go from there. Um, but yeah, like oranges. Um, my go-to for orange is typically to paint to paint a nice little gradient of yellow and then use red glazes over the top of it if I want a really vibrant orange, like if I'm doing lava or some kind of um, intense glow. If I just want, you know, a more subtle orange, I will start with the, I'll start with an ochre, mix in some orange into it or mix in some burnt red, create kind of a, a brown, a brown orange and then go from there, like a burnt sienna. Um, it really just comes down to the tone that you're that you're trying to get out of everything. All right, so we lost most of our brown on the little leggings or on the padded suit. So we're gonna have to go back and fix that. And we'll just do that with a wash. Um, but we'll do that here in a second. So I'm just gonna continue to build up because we're gonna go in and do that. Um, Any cool Team Tactic cards for Shocker? Uh, he does have a Team Tactic card. And as I recall, it is pretty fun. Um, it's a, if I'm remembering the card correctly, it's a team up card. So it's him obviously working with some of the other Sinister Six Spider Foes members. Uh, favorite tactic cards in this box, specific character affiliations, <sighs> uh, my favorite tactics card, man, I, I gotta think, now you're making me think about which tactic cards are in this box and which ones are in other boxes. <laughs> Say something and be like, they're not in this box, he lied. And then two years later, you'll see another card. Um, 
So one of the ones that I, I do remember that's in this box is a, um, I, I'm always a sucker for the team up cards. You know, the ones that are really cinematic, they kind of harken back to the days of Marvel Ultimate Alliance kind of combos and um, they really let you see the, the two characters on the tabletop working together to combine their powers. And there's one, um, there's one in there that has some gorgeous art, but it's for Shocker and Sandman. Um, and overall, it's, I think it's a solid, you know, it's a solid team up card if you're taking both those characters and um, looking for a good way to kind of like maximize their abilities on the table or feature them heavily. It's pretty fun, uh, but from like a flavor and a just enjoyment standpoint, I really like that one. And Josh really, him and the artist knocked, knocked the, the art on it out of the park. It's really gorgeous looking piece where you're seeing like Sandman and Electro mixing their powers to beat up some poor, some poor spider people like they want to do all the time. Just picking on those poor spiders. Um, and then there's another tactic cards in there that's specific to Vulture. Uh, which we talked about last week, um, which Josh was very, very insistent on having, and it is a nod to kind of the vulture Adrian Toomes always chasing his youth storylines, you know, where he can figure out how to rejuvenate himself. Um, and so I, I always remember that card because Josh pushed for it heavily and had a lot of a lot of strong emotions about how important it was to reference that those storylines and that kind of like common beat of Mr. Toombs. Um, and so it's in there. And he is the handsomest looking of vultures in that in that tactic card art. Like, the rejuvenation process was an undoubtable success when you see that art. So this is the point where you have to know when to stop because you can work on these little, just like with a Spider-Man and his little web lines and everything else, you could spend days and days and days on building up all these little padded diamonds. And it's the kind of the kind of focused hobby experience that I really enjoy to lose myself in because you just kind of get zoned in on one thing and you just kind of go back and forth and work the areas and make everything look fun. But, oh, I missed the inside of his arm. No, it's okay. We'll fix that really quick. Um, but we obviously only have so much time here, so I can't, I can't lose myself as much as I would prefer. But I do need to fix, you know, missing an entire entire section of his arm. That's that's not the best. So we'll just get that blocked in with color and then we'll leave it to dry up. Uh, I mean, as far as like the Electro design, he's, he's probably on uh, the higher level of his powers for sure. Um, not, not the ultimate level of his powers, obviously, but very few characters in Marvel Crisis Protocol are, can be designed at the upper echelons or the upper limits of their, their power set, right? Um, one of the beautiful things about comics is that characters are as powerful or as weak as the story needs them to be at the time it needs them to be that. And when you're working on a tabletop game, you don't, you know, we as designers or developers can't come in and immediately change the rules or the power level of the characters in order to suit a perfectly told story or experience on the tabletop. 
Um, so with that in mind, we're always having to kind of look at the median. So what's the, what's the level at which, you know, every character gets its moment to shine, has value and brings something interesting to the tabletop and gives players the ability to play in a balanced-ish environment because as we've always discussed, perfect balance isn't our goal in Crisis Protocol. Imperfectly balanced is, and that's what allows all these characters to be unique and different. Um, comes from, but yeah, with Electro, he's definitely, you know, he's one of the bigger hitters for the spider foes. And, uh, we did get we get to have some fun playing with his with his powers. And he serves, I think, you know, as when he comes out, I expect that um, there will be builds that really favor him as kind of a central aggressive part of the damage potential. Um, he can really muck with your opponent's plans. He obviously you know, plays around with shock pretty well, as, as long, along with other things, but. Um, he's absolutely a version that, on his own, could give Spider-Man a decent, decent run for his money. So when, when joined up with his other spider foes friends, um, he can pose a pretty significant threat to our poor little web swinging Peter Parker. But, you know, Parker also in Crisis Protocol has lots of friends that he can call on, so it's kind of it's kind of even in that way. Um, it is a team-based game, which again goes back to that whole idea of not, you know, not having the game devolve into everything's an omega level threat, everything is as powerful as it's ever been in the comics. It just wouldn't make for a very compelling game or interesting game, right? Um, the game is much more, as we kind of discuss on various interviews and casts and dev panels and such, you know, Crisis Protocol is the is the team up issue of Marvel Comics, and therefore every character, no matter how powerful, has their overall like power abilities reined in based on the fact that every character has to have their moment to shine. Every character has to have a reason to be there. Um, you can't just have a Hulk or a Captain Marvel come in and be able to solve literally every problem because they're the strongest character in the universe because you know you need a reason for Spider-Man to be there. You need a reason for Captain America to be there. You need a reason for Toad to be hanging around and doing stuff, right? Um, and so the challenge of the game is making sure that all these characters have that opportunity to do that. So that players have, you know, unique choices that they can make personally for them and your favorite character still has as much player as as much chance to shine based on game environments and decisions and all that other stuff that we can't control going in there. Uh, would we consider doing Arch Nemesis? I, I mean, I don't think we really stopped Arch Nemesis for any specific reason outside of the fact that we haven't really run across a moment where it's made a ton of sense. You know, one of the challenges with that rule is, especially when it comes to Spider-Man, literally every villain of Spider-Man kind of seems to believe that he is Peter Parker's arch nemesis. And, you know, um, <laughs> the game would get really, really wonky really fast if every character that could be an arch nemesis was an arch nemesis. So we kind of save it for those, you know, those iconic, the most iconic or the most apparent you know, comic book rivalry, rivalries as we can think of. Venom and Carnage, Spider-Man, Green Goblin, not, not Dr. Octopus, sorry. Sorry, Otto, but I don't... As much as you and the wall crawler have butted heads over the years, I think, you know, Norma Osborn takes the cake when it comes to arch nemesis of Peter Parker. So, yeah, like, will we see that, at, will we see that rule again? I have to believe that we will. Um, where it makes sense. But it is one of those that it takes up a lot of space in the card. 
So it really has to serve a strong narrative or character purpose. Um, because while it is a bonus, it's also pretty situational and it is also a negative, right? Like you, you do have to play around it and it's a way for your opponent to kind of mess with you and all that stuff. So um, it's just one that comes out very infrequently. And when it does come into the conversation, we always have to be really certain of the why we're doing it and you know that it's gonna be a big value add for the game and maybe not so much for the character, right? I don't think anyone would argue that Green Goblin is better because he has arch nemesis Peter Parker, but he certainly feels much more like Green Goblin because he has arch nemesis Peter Parker. And then cards like Blind Obsession, um, you know, those Team Tactic cards are always an interesting challenge to balance and to work around and um, would we ever see something like that again? Maybe. We just have to make sure that whatever's out there obviously works within the, you know, the fundamental systems of the game and doesn't unbalance things. One of the things with Blind Obsession that we ran into after making the card and realized a little later in the process was that um, Blind Obsession had some unintended consequences in some other game modes, like in Ultimate Encounters, it's, it's extremely good. Um, because you know you're only fighting one big bad so being able to blind obsession from the start to the whole thing for the whole game against the really big uh, cosmic threat is extraordinarily powerful and the downsides of that card are you know somewhat mitigated by the fact that there aren't other things you have to worry about targeting you or getting in your way or things like that so and that certainly wasn't a reason why that you know that card has kind of fallen out of rotation at this point. But it's just an example. It's one of those funny examples of, oh yeah, you know, everything you do has potential impacts in other places and you've got to be considerate of how those things interact. And when it comes to ultimate encounters, right, those are just, um, you know, those are directly game modes that players are told, hey, you get to build the experience the way you want. If you want to create the perfect counter team for it, then know that the ultimate encounter is not going to feel as challenging. And if you want to play narratively, that's kind of what they're meant for. So make decisions in that, in that vein, not necessarily the ones that are going to be perfect for the situation at hand. Um, so the use or no, not use of blind obsession falls kind of into that sphere if you want to use it to maximize the gameplay potential and the combos. It's totally your game. Um, just know that it's gonna obviously have a outsized impact on, you know, the ultimate encounters overall feel and, and flow. But there's 100% nothing wrong with that. Spider-Man is his own, it's true, it's true. He kind of is, he kind of is his own worst enemy. Which would be pretty funny for those mirror matches where he only has to, always has to fight himself. Thing is though, is that even though Peter Parker kind of makes his own life harder than it always needs to be, and he is somewhat his own worst enemy, he's very, um, non-confrontational when it comes to seeing all these other versions of himself, you know? He kind of just immediately accepts all of them as friends and chums and all that stuff. Versus how some other characters, you know, they always have the big, like, the big misunderstanding fight. And they're like, oh, it must be a must be a villain, must be an enemy. Spider-Man's always like, oh, another version of me. Cool. This one's obviously in the club. No worries. <sighs> it 
Yeah, one of the, so folks talking about a little bit in the chat about how being able to see these miniatures in three dimensions um, as we spin them around to get paint on them and everything. And it changes the overall perception and view of um, how good the sculpt looks or kind of what the sense of the miniature is. And, you know, one of the things that's really tricky about making miniatures and our studio photographer who does an amazing job on all those awesome product images and marketing images and everything, Matt Furbishay, um, you know, one of the challenges is, is that taking a three-dimensional object and then turning it into a two-dimensional image, whether that's a human being or a miniature or what have you, right? The camera does weird things to make the picture work. It flattens and distorts, you know, that third dimension that's so important because it can only do so much. And that's why, you know, those famous camera illusions are such a big deal where it's like, look, I'm, a, I'm pushing up the Eiffel or the Leaning Tower of Pisa or, you know, I'm holding something in the palm of my hand. Um, and it's because of how the camera just functions uh, and how it creates those two-dimensional images and those pictures that we all come to know and love. So it's always really important to understand that, well, you know, we have a lot of tricks and I don't want to call them cheats, but techniques to make sure that the three-dimensional nature and story of the miniature is revealed to the viewer. In the end of the day, um, no picture is ever going to be able to match the reality of the physical miniature in your hands. So you're all often, you know, I don't think I've ever in all of my time being involved in miniatures games, whether as a creator or a player or anything else, I've never once really run into a situation where the actual miniature looked worse than the picture. It's always the other way around. The picture never looks as good as the actual miniature itself. And it's because the camera just simply can't do justice to the way the miniature looks, the way the miniature is. And that's another part of the reason why, if you were here last week, we talked a little bit about our sculpting process. Um, but that's also why we don't, we don't evaluate miniatures on screen in their digital CAD programs because those CAD programs they're also cheating to make it seem like, you know, something is three-dimensional. But it's, it's 2D, it's two-dimensional on screen. So it can cheat all at once and kind of do these little tricks to make your eye think that it's in three dimensions or in three-dimensional space, but it's only in two-dimensional space on the screen. So every, every Tuesday, uh, we hop into the office and we have what's called our CAM. And that's basically our miniature review and approval meeting. And so what we do is we print out all of the sculpts that have been completed or things that are currently in process um, on the sculpting side. We print them all out and we sit down at a table and we look at them all together and we make notes and we make comments about things that need to change or things that aren't working properly, things that need to shift. Um, And that then informs, or those notes go back to the engineers on our team, and they make the appropriate adjustments and corrections, you know, whether that's this miniature's scaled wrong, so they're too big, they're too small, this effect isn't working, can we like warble this out? Like for example, when we first got Shocker in, you know, the effect around his gauntlets was just like it was just jagged, it was just a jaggedy circle. So it didn't have any of this dimension to it. It didn't have these little folds and this crackle, these little balls to it. And so those were notes that we made in terms of once we saw the physical print of, you know, the effect, we started saying, okay, can we, can we do this? Can we do that? This is going to look better if we go here. And you learn those tips and you, like, you learn those tricks and those ideas and those notes the more you do it, just like anything else. Um, so we applied, you know, 
we applied things that we learned from doing Clea's energy effect or a spell effect, like things with the ball and how the balls can connect into the energy to make them look seamless and integrated like we see in, you know, in comics and stuff. Um, we talked, you know, we talked about the depth of the little uh, padded suit panel lines and how deep they needed to be and maybe they needed to be deeper or maybe, you know, we needed to separate them out more based on how the print was looking. Um, how the pose looked, was he leaning too far forward, did he need to come back a little bit? All of these things that you really can't tell um, in a two-dimensional environment that are so important to the overall success of the miniature itself, to the art of the sculpt and everything. And so, Um, CAM is probably the most important meeting that we have in terms of getting, a, getting the sculpts to the position where they are. You know, it, we're fortunate that our sculpting manager, Mike Jones, he, doesn't, he does fantastic work with the sculptors. He has a great understanding of how, you know, that computer-generated sculpt will look in real life. Um, so... You know, he pays attention to the notes and how things go, and we learn and improve, but at the end of the day, the print tells all. And so it's only by viewing the print of the mini that we can really judge how the effects are working, what needs to change, how we can make the overall miniature better, or if we succeeded, you know? And sometimes, sometimes we, get a, we get a sculpt, we look at it, in print and we get to say the magical words no notes and then at that point tony gets to do the rest of his job so, uh what time do we change the base so the base changes well the base can change for a couple of different reasons the biggest one typically is once we again go to cam and we get the print in and we see um, how the miniature oh no once we see how the miniature fits on the base, at that point we have to make a decision, right? Like, is there too much overhang? Both Shocker and Vulture were originally conceived of as being on 35 mil bases. But, um, as we kind of saw the sculpting process go and as we continued to push the Shocker, Shockwave effect um, to be as cool as it possibly could be, uh, through discussions with myself and Dallas and Marco and Evan and everyone else on the team, we kind of just realized, hey, like we can we can make this super cool, but if we do so, um, it's probably not going to fit on a 35 mil base anymore. And for the most part, um, you know, unless a character has a lot of really impressive or important movement shtick built into their their kit. Um, changing the base is of minimal-ish impact in terms of the character potential. Like, yes, they will obviously move further um, than on a 35, but again, um, unless movement is part of your very specific like power set or you have a lot of ways to abuse movement, you know, you're a Sam Wilson or something like that, um, it doesn't typically cause too many issues to go back if we have to and uh, and change the move or the base size and the movement difference. And at the end of the day, we're happy to do that because our goal is always to create incredible looking miniatures because that's why we all play the game, I think, you know? The game itself is awesome, but the game is built around the idea and the use of these really incredible characters being sculpted and painted and used in miniature form, right? We create, we create these miniature scale battlefields of the Marvel Universe or wherever else um, to live out those little experiences, those shared experiences with our friends and folks we meet at places like Adepticon to play games with and stuff. So it's very, very important to us internally 
that the miniatures always be the stars of the show. And look as amazing as we can possibly make them. And then in the case like Vulture, sometimes, um, you know, you kind of fit, but there's a little bit of a question where it's like, well, you know, kind of fits, but it looks really cramped on the base, so it doesn't look as good. Can we go up in base size, or should we go up in base size? And it's a question. Um, and then, you know, we, we have a discussion about it. And one of the things with Vulture was that he actually worked better on the larger base size. It kind of gave him a boost that he was missing in the testing feedback because he is very mobile and movement based. And so many of his abilities, you know, kind of get amped up when he's on that larger base size. Um, and so in that case, it was one of those ones where it was good for the miniature and it was good for the game design and development process and where we were. So we'll work synergistically in that way too. Um, and then the, the, the final part of it is, is that when you see those renders of those characters at a thing like, um, you know, Mini Stravaganza, which we'll have in July, which will have some cool previews and stuff, um, or, you know, at an Adepticon roadmap, when you're looking at those sculpt renders, the, the engineers and the sculptors themselves, they haven't been told what base size the thing goes on. So they're kind of just making their best guess if they haven't been part of the meeting or discussion. Um, and a lot of times they'll just default to the standard base size. So you really shouldn't, you know, those are, those are definitely farther looking um, kind of previews. So don't put a lot of stock into what base size you may or may not see because again, there's no real, we're not worrying about it at that point. We're just simply showing off the character and there are plenty of details yet to, to be hammered out and fin finalized or finished. So I worked on another IP. I mean, there's so many cool IPs out there. So that's a tough question to answer. Um, I think I could pick like six or seven of them that I'd immediately jump at, given the chance. But also, to be fair, Marvel and, Marvel and Star Wars keep us pretty busy. Um, there's always cool stuff to explore and do and everything else. But uh, I think honestly you could pick just about anything from from the 80s or 90s animated animations. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big 80s and 90s cartoon guy. Um, so pick pretty much anything from that, from that era of animation programming and like I would be in on it. You could get weird with it too and I'd still probably be in because I just, you know, for me that was childhood. That was, that was a lot of the formative formative years and formative memories and everything else. Um, that would definitely be where I would go first. Uh, we really kind of lost ourselves on that red and that's fine. I'm going to transparent brown, I guess. I don't think we have the washes here. So before we end, I just want to do I just want to do a little bit of lining on the suit because I feel like we lost we lost some of our look here. So we're gonna do it the hard way. So this is the way that I said that I normally wouldn't want to do it if I could avoid it um, because there will be a little bit of cleanup to it. But all I'm doing is I'm just using some transparent brown. Uh, a wash would work here too, but I'm going to carefully apply it following the paneling of the suit. Um, and Do just you ever kinda... get nervous that when you um, are working with a color like yellow or you know, yellow ochre here, that if you apply a wash over it, that it'll just muddy everything again? So 100%, like if you just did a flat, like I'm going to slap wash over everything, 
it absolutely will it absolutely will stain um, the whole effect. So typically, um, now you, you can do that. You can just say, okay, I know that that's gonna happen and I'm gonna go back in and I'll reclaim, I'll reclaim my colors and it'll be fine because I know what I'm getting myself into. Um, so, but if you're gonna do that, then you wanna do it, you know, ideally, right? It just makes sense to do it before you've done all of your highlighting and, and everything else. Um, so you would lay on, you know, you'd lay on your yellow ochre. If I was going to do it that way, I would lay on my yellow ochre and then I would go through and I would just do um, my wash over top, knowing that it was going to kind of like tint everything. Um, and then I could come back through, but, but the tint from the wash isn't going to make the yellow base so dark that you can't work from it, that you can't build up your highlights from it. It just means that you're gonna have to go back through and kind of like, you know, carefully reclaim all these, all these little sections. Um, and even with something like an oil wash where you can remove really all of the oil from the acrylic, the reality of the situation is, is that you're not probably gonna work the um, removal process so hard that you're not gonna have some tinting left. Um, so if you plan for it, you can actually use that to your advantage. For example, you can blow out your highlights, which is the, um, I think that's the most common practice, is effectively you would finish all of your little parts um, or all of the little segments, you know, your yellow, and you would just go two steps beyond what you feel like the correct amount of highlighting would be so you'd really blow them out, but you would do that knowing that those, those highlights are gonna to get toned back down um, by, by your wash. Um, and so you're, you're using it strategically, you're using it as a technique, um, similar to how you know, you'll see Dallas, especially, and sometimes myself, use the um, you know, it's the wash over the zenith highlight to really quickly create shadows and gradients and everything with just one pass. The idea is the same there in that you're just using those blown out highlights um, with the wash tint, the transparent layer, to create the proper amount of highlight in shadows and, and mid-tones. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to approach it. But obviously at this point, um, this is kind of the, the level that I never want to be in, which is you spent a decent amount of time working on these little areas and now you're going to go through and kind of pin wash in all these little sections. Because as you can see, no matter how careful I am, I'm still going to have some overspill. I'm still going to have some sections that I'm going to have to clean up. And there's a couple ways to play with that. Like I'm a little less concerned in the shadow areas if I get overspill because those areas should be darker anyway. So I'm kind of playing with that blown out highlight idea. Um, you can just very carefully go back in and do stuff. For example, on this chest here, I don't know if you can see that, but it's pretty dark. Like that would be a dark part of the miniature, so I could actually just go in and do what we talked about and just lay over the wash just directly over it. And then potentially just go back in and clean it up or I could pull some of the wash off with the brush in the areas that I felt like would be a little brighter. Um, so there's, there's no one right or wrong way to do it. Oh, except for throwing your brush at yourself. That's the wrong way to do it. Don't throw your brush. Um, so yeah, uh, there's the biggest thing when doing stuff like this is just a little bit of planning about how you wanna tackle the effect or what techniques you're gonna use will save you a lot of time, potentially if you have to go back and you know rejig or something like I did. So my original idea was, hey, I'm gonna do this wash. It's gonna darken all of the recesses and then it's gonna be dark enough that I can wash my yellow ochre over it and hey, howdy, hey, you know, I'm gonna have this nice dark lining that's gonna stay in the crevices um, and my ochre is gonna go over the top. 
and most of my work's going to be done. What happened was, is that the ochre in this monument series is so strong um, that it kind of just covered up the brown. And so it was a little more potent than I expected. So now I have to kind of switch my game plan here. And that'll absolutely happen from time to time too. So lots of, lots of different ideas and tricks. And this is, you know, frustrating if you want to do something quickly, you know, you have a time limit, you want to get something done within an hour or whatever. Um, obviously having to go back and redo things that you thought were going to be done before can be, um, can be frustrating. But this more than anything else is, you know, this is art. This is the part of the process that can be the most rewarding because you can always go back as long as you're using thin layers and change your approach, change your techniques, um, rework an area or come back to an area and think about it differently as you see how it goes. Um, like for example, I've just kind of given up on the, on the lining and what I'm doing now is I'm just tinting everything with this color. Um, and I feel like I can kind of get away with that because my yellows were a bit brighter than I wanted them to be and they're a little paler than I want them to be because Shocker's got this nice rich color to him. And honestly, there's even an opportunity here to just kind of like put it over the reds too and use this as a unifying color because it's transparent. So it's just like a thin little transparent or like a thin little cellophane layer, you know, and it'll kind of unify and tie everything back together. So once again, we've just shifted, we've just shifted pattern here and now we're doing this little, this little glazed tint to really bring things around. Uh, somebody asked, let's see, most obscure character that people have championed in the office. Um, well, we definitely get, we definitely get some, uh, we get some requests in the office for the wall, who if you don't know is a villain, I think that was exclusive to a New York Yankees comic strip <laughs> about Spider-Man and Spider-Man decides to go for a relaxing day and watch a ball game. And then it is brutally interrupted by the wall who is literally just a man who is a brick wall. Uh, so he's like a brick wall a red brick wall and he's got he's got a face in the wall and legs and um, it's ridiculous and all the great comic book ways that those classic things are so we get we get some wall we get some wall requests every once in a while stilt man's another one that comes up quite a bit i don't know if he's super obscure but he's definitely one of those one of those ones that not everyone you know, not everyone's first thought when they're like, working on a Marvel game, let's make, let's make Stilt Man. Stilt Man, that's what the game needs. Um, so yeah, there's 100%, there are, um, there are some pretty odd, odd requests that come out from time to time. A lot of the times I feel like it's somebody just reading the Marvel you know, they just looked through the Marvel Encyclopedia. They found the weirdest entry they could, and they're like, oh, I'm going to bring this up. Like, we should do this. <laughs> just because. I want to see if he'll say yes. One of these days I will. And then I'll be like, well. And then, then you'll call their bluff. That's right. You wanted this, so here you go. You asked for it. You got this now. <sighs> Big wheel. Sure. I, I regret to inform around. you that unless this is going to be no, we're done. A nine we're done. This is as far as oh, we're getting. We okay. got we got most of the suit done, but I got meetings. I got things. I got things I got to do. It's two o'clock. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Hopefully, you had some fun getting some base colors down on the shocker suit. We still have to do the shocker shock wave and, of course, his shocker gauntlets. But we'll get to that later, and then we've got a lot of cleanup to do on this guy as well. But uh, we've gotten a really good solid foundation down uh, to work from from there. So thank you so much for joining me. 
Tomorrow Dallas Kemp's gonna be back. I have no idea what he's painting, but it'll be something cool, that's for sure. And you'll be able to see him at 1 p.m. Pacific, as always, and I'll be back uh, next week for... Do you Riley not know what he's painting? I don't Riley know what he's painting. I assumed it was more sand. I mean, there you go. So, um, so it'll be it'll be one of one of the many potential foes of the spider foes, apparently. Um, so be sure to tune in for that. And then otherwise, we'll see you on the next one on Tuesdays, 1 p.m. Pacific, and Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific. Till next time, take care. I'm Will. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.